It's her son's fourth birthday. So Madam Luo ordered a cake from home-based bakery Peachy Sugar Maker. She had heard rave reviews about the customised cakes. But Madame Luo realised something was amiss when she collected the cake. The cake looked slightly melted. But the baker confirmed that it was still safe to eat. So Madame Luo served it to her family and guests at the party. The next day, the sweet festivity took an unexpected turn. Everyone who ate the cake had stomach aches and fever, and most were sent to the hospital. But they were not the only ones. In total, 47 people had food poisoning after eating food from the bakery between 5th and 9th August. 12 were hospitalised. A cake sample from one of the families was tested and found contaminated with salmonella. This is the first case of food poisoning attributed to a home-based food business in the past two years. Since the pandemic, the number of home-based food businesses have more than tripled. But unlike food shops like cafes and restaurants, home-based food businesses don't need a license to operate. So I want to find out just how safe the food from a home-based business is. The thing is, there are guidelines on food safety drawn out for home-based food businesses by the Singapore Food Agency. For instance, food handlers need to wear face masks during food preparation, wash their hands with water and soap after visiting the washroom, and handle raw and cooked food with separate equipment. Food shops like cafes and restaurants, however, have way stricter measures to enforce these practices. They need to apply for a yearly license that costs 195 Sing dollars. Inspection and hygiene grading are also conducted. Any food safety lapses found and sellers risk getting demerit points and having their license suspended. Since home-based businesses are selling food to the public as well, should they be subject to the same regulations? For some answers, I'm heading to Incubaker. Wow. Used to be a home-based business, but now he's expanding in scale. And in our shared kitchen, he can make easily five times more than what he's used to. This is Terence Ho. He set up this shared working kitchen for home cooks such as Laurent, keen to scale up at a licensed premise. Terence, food shops like restaurants and cafes are subject to stricter measures like licensing, hygiene grading, as well as inspections. Do you think home-based businesses should follow suit? Oh yes, most definitely, Ray. We are looking at a scale of home-based F&B businesses that have mushroomed just in these two years, you know. Anecdotally, we've done a survey. We're looking at about maybe up to 90,000 F&B home-based businesses in Singapore alone. Wow. So in terms of scale, how big can these home-based businesses grow? I know of a lady who just makes pineapple tarts and just leading up to Chinese New Year, we're looking at five-figure revenues easy. Wow, five figures. Yes. We've got obviously some home-based businesses doing so much better in terms of revenue than your standard hawker, mom and pop shop, a neighborhood center. With all this scale, the question is, why aren't the regulations keeping up? How does the risk of contamination compare to, say, restaurants and food establishments? Oh, definitely a lot higher. So according to the guidelines, these home-based F&B businesses must operate in a small scale. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is small? Is it 500 pineapple tarts? Is it 1,000 muruku? Your guess is as good as mine. No one knows. Yeah, exactly. So if that is not clear, people don't know where the lines are. When scale exceeds a person's capacity, things can go crazy. I went once to support a home-based business. I went into the house to collect my goods, and what I saw didn't give me a lot of confidence. There was food waiting in the bedrooms. There was food defrosting in pails in the bathroom. Oh. I submit that that's just the tip of the iceberg. With the number of people doing home-based businesses, we're technically sitting on a ticking time bomb. To find out how high the risk of consuming foods from these businesses really is, 
I want to run foods from some of our favorite home-based businesses through a lab test. To start me out, I asked you what you want investigated. If you have any recommendations, drop them in the comment box below. Based on your responses, I've shortlisted these. Tiramisu, Basque burnt cheesecake, egg fried rice, curry chicken, nasi lemak, and salad. I have picked food items that while popular, may have a higher risk of food contamination. And I ordered them from popular home-based food businesses with follower counts of at least 1,000. Over the next week, the lab will test these food items for the volume of bacteria and the presence of salmonella, one of the most dangerous pathogens that can cause food poisoning. While waiting for the test results, I'm springing a surprise on two home-based food businesses. Are you confident enough to take on an inspection? Will they pass the food hygiene test? I'm investigating just how safe the foods we buy from home-based businesses are. So far, I've discovered that sellers don't need to be licensed. But what about courses they can take? I'm finding out about food safety courses available for people who want to start a home-based F&B business. Here it says that while it's encouraged, it's not compulsory for them. Welcome to today's food safety course level one. All right, so... This one-day course is compulsory for all food handlers in food shops, like restaurants and hawker stalls. But home-based food sellers can make up about a quarter of the participants here. 5 to 60 degrees Celsius is what we call danger zone temperature. Germs can spread even faster. So I'm going to just do a demo on how to do your hand washing procedures. There will be two parts for your assessment criteria, okay? Written assessment and what we call the practical performance. Proceed. We did cover this during the lesson, the chiller storage. Yes. So, I will put the cooked food into the top shelf first. And then, the raw meat to avoid contamination goes at the bottom. Awesome, you nail it there, eh? Great! Okay. Usually at home, our fridges are more packed than this, so I would probably miss something like this. Okay, Ray. So, this is your return assessment result. Congratulations, you clear all of them. Oh! Yeah! Full marks, people! That's right. Only those who pass are allowed to prepare food and beverages in F&B establishments. So why is it not compulsory for home-based business owners to take this course? First off and foremost, they run on a smaller scale, okay? And uh, another thing is they do not need to apply for a license. But scale can be more than expected. So shouldn't we make it compulsory for all home-based business owners to take this course? Definitely. A lot of food handlers might think the way how they prepare the food is that simple, okay? And uh, actually they are not, okay? For example, like defrosting of food. A lot of food handlers, they actually defrost their food at the room temperature. By right, they are not supposed to do that because under room temperature, that is where your germ multiplication to a dangerous level. If you're a food handler at a restaurant or cafe, there is a real incentive to take all the information you've learned and put into practice. The authorities will inspect your premises. However, there's no such pressure for home-based businesses. Twenty-nine-year-old Pa Chi Fan from Home Bakery, The Crane Grain, and City Rauda, who's been a home cook for more than ten years, had both gone through the basic food safety course. Hey, Chi Fan. Hey, Ray. How's it going? They have invited me to their homes today, yeah. thinking that I'm profiling them for a feature about their food. This tree actually serves up to twelve packs. We get about thirty jars of pineapple tarts a day, and about three to five whole cakes a day as well. Truth is. I'm going to spring them a surprise. A spot check of their premises. 
So actually today, I've got a little something going on. Okay. Are you confident enough to take on a surprise inspection? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> really? Yes, I am. <laughs> Helping me out is Jesse Tan. He's got over a decade of experience conducting food safety inspections for F&B businesses. Hi, Jesse. Hi. 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 So, Jesse, what are we looking out for in the kitchen? First of all, we will just do a check on the personal hygiene. One thing would be your fingernails. Can I just take a look? This is great. You have them cut and trimmed short. Do you yeah. wear a hair net while you bake? I do wear them when especially I have a lot of orders going on that day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good hygiene practice. Let me take a look at your utensils. Huh? Sure. You cannot find any form of food remnants or residue on it. You have this covered, mm -hmm. which is good. Now, let's take a look at your storage facilities. This is the chest freezer. It's good that you have a separate freezer to store food for your home-based business. This fridge has actually been around for a long time, I presume? Yeah, 10 years. Ten yeah, that's years. why I'm letting it go. From the gaskets, you see, all these are turning hot and getting mouldy. Starting to crack as well. So it's not going to be effective. What's inside? Just frozen meat? Yeah, it's just frozen meat. Uh, let's see something here. Mm, Thai sweet chilli sauce. We can consider keeping the chilli sauce at another place. This is almost considered ready to eat. But the meat here is still considered raw or maybe half cooked. The second thing, it doesn't have a temperature display, so it's very hard for you to check whether this freezer is at the correct storage temperature or not. Freezers should be at minus 18 degrees Celsius or below. In bigger food establishments, they would have uh, bigger freezers and then they would have a temperature display for you to keep track of the temperature of the freezer itself. But how feasible is that for a home-based business, right? Because commercial freezers are so much more expensive. One quick way to solve it would be to purchase a thermometer and then place it inside the freezer. Okay, let's see. So far, looks fine. Um, this is just a suggestion, okay? The raw eggs I will usually put at the bottom of my fridge because salmonella can be found in the guts of chicken. So when the egg passes out, the exterior itself might have already been contaminated and then it goes into the eggs through its pores. So it's impossible to actually tell. So it would be better to store at the most uh, bottom layer so that it. it will not contaminate the rest of your food items. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, these eggs are more problematic than I thought. <laughs> so Siti, how do you think your inspection went? Average? Okay. I know I fall short on some of the things but I learned a few more things today, which is good. Do you think there should be tighter regulations on home-based businesses to ensure food safety? Food handlers should at least minimally go for the basic food hygiene course. How about inspections? How are we actually going to monitor that people are sticking to these safe food practices? I think inspections might be a bit too extreme. People are relying on home-based businesses as an alternative source of income. Very tight regulations might kill off this whole income flow for them. City and Chi Fan's home kitchen and preparation processes are generally quite clean. But even then, Jesse spotted a few storage practices that can be improved on. Now, these would have gone unnoticed without an inspection. So it only goes to show that when it comes to food safety, there are way more potential sources of contamination than what even the most seasoned of home-based sellers would expect. Earlier, I sent six different types of dishes from home-based food businesses for testing. I'm about to find out how safe they really are. One week ago, I dropped off samples of six food items bought from popular home-based businesses at a lab. Tiramisu, Basque burnt cheesecake, egg fried rice, nasi lemak, curry chicken, and salad. We are testing them against store-bought ones as a control. Readings were taken an hour after the food arrived at the lab. The food items underwent two tests. 
first, a general test for the volume of bacteria. And a second, the test specifically for the presence of salmonella, the most common pathogen found in contaminated food. So what do the results tell us? So the good news is none of the food samples have salmonella. That's great. Next, we actually look at hygiene level of the food and whether the food has been contaminated by any organisms. These groups of bacteria that we're looking at is called the Enterobacteriaceae. So according to Singapore Food Agency's recommendation for ready-to-eat food, the Enterobacteriaceae count should be below 10,000. So for bus burn cheesecake, fried rice and curry chicken, whether they are home-based pieces or store-bought, they are all 10 or below. So these three items have the lowest enterobacteria C count. Why is that? These three products are usually going through high heat treatments whereby they are either baked at a high temperature or cooked at high temperature and usually it's 75 degrees Celsius and above. Now let me go to another product that we tested, Nasi Lemak. This will be an interesting result for home-based business we found about 35 count of Enterobacteria C, and for store-bought, it's about 11,000. That is like 300 times more. Let me show you the results that we observed on the petrifilm in the lab. So this is a store-bought, this is a home base. Nasi lemak, although majority of the ingredients are cooked, there are also raw ingredients. We know that home-based business, they are prepared just in time. So oh, today, I have ordered a five-pack. I prepare just in time five pack and then I deliver. As compared to store bought, store need to actually predict what is the sales for today. Uh, I may be expecting a high volume of purchase, so I may prepare certain ingredients in bulk way in advance, or I may outsource the cut cucumbers to come in from a third party, and those actually are prepared way in advance, and therefore there are higher chance of exposure to environment contaminants, and the count will grow. Since I talked about raw ingredients, let's look at salad. Okay. Okay, so for home-based business, we have about 4,000 count. Uh -huh. And then store-bought is around 7,000 too. Oh, so for the nasi lemak and the salad, the count is higher for the store-bought ones. But we see an interesting result here for tiramisu. Oh, that's one of my favourites. Okay. So, for tiramisu, home-based business have about 1,900. Mm -hmm. While store-boughts, actually, we didn't detect anything. Oh. One possible reason is bakery or those big patisserie, they usually have very large walk-in freezers or walk-in chillers that are able to maintain the temperature of storage very well, way below 4 degrees or even way below uh, 0 degrees Celsius. While a home-based business, our capacity is small and sometimes if the fridge or freezers is actually packed with other food, it may have raised the temperature slightly above 4 degrees Celsius and therefore, it may actually cause enterobacteria to slowly multiply along the way. But don't worry, it's still far below the 10,000 recommendations. Even when some contain higher risk ingredients like uncooked vegetables, turns out most food we tested from home-based businesses were as safe or even safer than store-bought ones. Only the tiramisu from a home-based business had higher counts of bacteria than the store-bought one, possibly because of inadequate chiller conditions. Thanks, man. But there is a category of high-risk food I've yet to investigate. Over the past one week, I've been scouring through the social media accounts of various home-based businesses, and I discovered some businesses that sold these. Raw oysters, and sushi. According to the Singapore Food Agency or SFA's website, home-based businesses are not allowed to sell ready-to-eat raw fish, which includes shellfish like oysters. And after clarifying with the agency, I found out that this applies to partially raw seafood too, like these cockles. But on the social media and websites of these home-based sellers, it's clearly stated that their food items can be eaten raw or semi-raw. I'm calling up some of these sellers to find out if they know they're breaking the law. 
Hi, I'm Ray from CNA. Are you guys aware that you're not supposed to sell ready-to-eat seafood like salmon, oysters and cockles? Not really, no. We are simply a reseller. Yeah, and we are just helping as a service to shut them. Our cockles are not raw. We cook it, we parboil it. Actually, for partially raw shellfish, home-based businesses aren't allowed to sell them. Are you aware of that? Uh, no, I'm not aware. Did it ever occur to you that it's quite risky selling raw food, especially seafood? These are frozen oysters, okay? So they were flash frozen throughout the entire transit process all the way to Singapore. So they, of course, go through the SFA checks and uh, after that, they are approved as safe to eat for raw consumption. I have sold many, many so far and there has been no issues at all. How do you make sure your cockles are safe to consume? We don't keep any stocks that are unsold or anything, we'll just um, throw them away. Okay, so now that you're aware that you can't sell seafood for raw consumption, are you still going to carry on? Oh yeah, that's why now my sting has been lost since you say like this already. <laughs> then probably we will have to like find a place to open a shop. We don't really want because we have four kids and then being at home, we can oversee them as well. It looks like these home-based sellers aren't even aware that they're not supposed to sell ready-to-eat raw or partially raw seafood. While these sellers say that nothing bad has happened to any of their customers, I'm definitely going to think twice before I order raw fish from them. So how safe are foods from home-based food businesses? Well, I found out that they are generally safe, especially if they've gone through high heat processes like these pineapple tarts. In some cases, they're even safer than store-bought ones. But with more and more of these businesses entering this growing industry, I think it's worthwhile to make it compulsory for sellers to attend a basic food safety course. In the meantime, I'm going to be a smarter consumer by making sure I check for any signs of melting on the desserts that I order, especially if they contain raw ingredients like eggs, and I'm going to stay away from raw, ready-to-eat seafood from these home-based businesses. <laughs>